Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the uh, Monday, June 25th meeting of the Pembroke Board of Selectmen. And we'll start off with a Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Greetings. I hope everybody's having a very good summer so far. And uh, let me just advise everybody that uh, please note that this meeting is being made available to the public through a live video and audio broadcast. Excuse me. On uh, Comcast Government Channel Access 15, and is being recorded for broadcast for future dates. Comments made in open session will be recorded. May I also say that. Uh, Pembroke Town News is recording uh, this also. Uh, first thing up on the agenda um, would be 7 o'clock, the town accountant, Mike Buckley, to talk about workman's compensation insurance fund. Good evening, Mike. How you doing? Good. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to speak to me tonight. I'm here to talk to you about the way we manage risk as it relates to workers' compensation, our responsibilities for work, workers' compensation, and insurance. I think we all know the budget is extremely tight, it has been for quite some time, it projects to be tight going forward for the next few years anyways, and we're struggling to maintain the level of services, at least fire, public safety, um, public works, education, over the five years now. So it's our, it's our duty, it's our obligation to present you from time to time with um, ideas we have to, to save money um, in short term and long term. So right now we pay um, roughly $300,000 a year for our workers' comp policy with the Mega Property and Casualty Company and that is through Anna Ryan, a local agent from Pembroke. So over the last three years, the town has paid $926,000 of that coverage. During that same period of time, Mega has paid $430,000 of the claims. So that's a variance of roughly $500,000 over the past three years. Now, no one can guarantee that the $430,000 last three years of experience are going to be the same as the next three years of experience, but that is what it is. The, uh, we have paid out a lot more than we have received the benefits over the last three years. So I'm proposing that for fiscal 19, which starts next week, um, we do not purchase the cover. We have $300,000 budgeted, $310,000 budgeted, for that expense, and I propose that we um, pay those claims directly. I propose that we contract with Cook and Company from Marshfield to administer, manage, and rate our claims. They're going to charge us if we take this path and provide those services for the sum of $18,000. So that will leave us with approximately $292,000 uh, from which to provide the claims during the next 12 months. Um, as I said before, the three-year average of losses is $143,000. The 10-year average is $172,000. So no one can guarantee <coughs> what will happen in the future, but the last 10 years of history says that we will um, save money by taking this approach. And I'm further recommending that for the first few years, we earmark most of the savings for our workers' fund, trust fund. With the idea that over the first two, three, four, five years, we build up enough reserves, $400,000 of reserves. So if we do have a spike, if we do have a serious incident, I will be better able to handle that. And then once we have adequate reserves, we can begin to draw down or reduce the amount we have budgeted uh, for workers' comp. And we can redirect that money towards the efforts that the public wants us to see. We aspire, as I said, public works, paving, school. That's the idea. It's sort of a long-term, short-term um, plan with long-term benefits. We 
last year took the approach. There's a separate insurance for police and fire. It's called 111. Uh, we took that approach last year with them. We saved quite a bit of money in the past 12 months uh, doing that. We'd like to do that with our with some coverage as well. It does, though, present risk. And any time you present a risk to the town, it would be something that the board should talk about. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's talk about the risk, Mike. There's, <clears throat> I, I know a, a trade union in Boston took a similar approach with, with their health care, uh, became self self insured, and um, in one year they got a slew of. Um, of uh, very bad illnesses, uh, several cases cases of cancer and, um, and debilitating illnesses, and it they almost went bankrupt. You know, the, the, the local union that has been around for over a hundred years almost went bankrupt because they took that risk. So, talk a little bit more about our risk. Okay. Um, well, as I said, over the past ten years, um, our average has been. $172,000 in costs and expenses that the insurance companies paid out. Uh, we've paid close to $3 million. Um, we have had over that 10 years 270 claims. Those claims have averaged $6,374. During that period of time, the last 10 years, five claims have gone over the $100,000. Though those claims were over a hundred thousand dollars, they weren't paid all, all at once. It took a period of two or three or four years to uh, to incur those expenses. And um, I would also say that the municipal property in the life of the hood, I would argue that some of those claims weren't in municipal property by the insurance carrier. And if we, along with Cook, are managing those claims, I think uh, Experience would be better. If the board so chooses, we can look at um, buying a couple stop loss policy. Uh, the one we looked at so far would cost $68,000 as opposed to the $300,000, the $310,000, and that would cover any claims over $300,000. Now, I'm not so sure that I'm in favor of that, but it does provide some protection in case the worst. Could you, could you uh, tell us departmentally uh, what percentage of each department uh, has workman's comp claims? DPW has X amount, school has X amount. I can tell you it's roughly, again, police and fire is a different program, but it's roughly 50% school, 50%, which is probably 40% school, 40% DPW, and <coughs> The rest being people you wouldn't think, office workers and, and the like, who slip and fall and that. So. Okay. <clears throat> and I, I wanted to know that because, you know, an office worker, slip and fall, a carpal tunnel versus DPW, more of an industrial accident, sure. you know, of course, sore backs and knees and, that, and the like. Yeah, um, believe it or not, one of our worst was just <clears throat> slip and fall. The question was raised as to whether or not we could do this. And uh, we received a two-page email from Town Council Carolyn Murray and, and uh, stated that um, the part of the workers' compensation law dealing with um, uh, being self-insured is that under 24, 25B, it said the previous section, which deals with self-insurance, uh, shall not apply to the Commonwealth, the NTA, the MBTA, uh, the Port of Authority, or various cities, towns, and uh, districts. So um, the town of Pembroke can legally uh, become self-insured, as Mike is suggesting. In fact, I believe he works for a community that is self-insured. 
that one we share him with. So, uh, so uh, you know, it, it's something that can can be done legally. Uh, yeah, this uh, stop loss policy that possibly started out with, just kind of like you know, just in case until we were able to raise the funds up high enough where we wouldn't need that anymore, or would you continue to do so just in case because we still want that safety net? I would, sorry, I would look at that every year. Okay. Um, I would sleep better at night if we had the three hundred thousand say in reserve. Mm -hmm. Um, and until then, purchase the stop loss. Uh, that would sleep better, would cover our risk, would cap our risk. Um, but there's no wrong answer, and I think it's one of those things you have to look at every year. And I can't tell you I won't be back here um, sometime, or someone else will not be back here sometime soon when she purchased the coverage because it gets more. Could I ask <clears throat> on that? No, you have. Uh, could you just describe a little more clearly what the fund manager's role will be? Um, well, nothing will change for the employees. Nothing will change um, as far as benefits paid out or anything like that. Right now, Mega, the insurance company. Administer the, the claims, manages the claims, provide for the, for the, for the claims. Um, Cook would take over that role. And I would just have to say, from dealing with Cook and uh, dealing with the current carrier, I'm a lot more optimistic that the uh, claims administration and case management was so, which is so critical, uh, especially during the first couple of weeks. Um, based on experience, I would say that. Uh, the town accepted through town meeting vote chapter 40 section 13a does that allow the board of selectmen to take this action without further town meeting vote <coughs> yes it does and I, I would argue we could do it administratively but um, it's not really something the board's talked about before but again that risk that we're accepting I just felt more comfortable coming in front of you and talking about it in public we did it last year um, administratively And sorry, I have a lot of questions. Uh, Cook Company, uh, have any other companies been contacted to to vet out to make sure the Cook and Company is the best value for the town? Um, no, they haven't. But we could do that if more wishes. Sure, that's fine. There's no from experience. Cook has done a great job with the police and fire over the past couple months, and they've helped us a lot with our um, with our health insurance. And, you know, they allow me, um, Helping us manage our cloud exposure. Do you have a one more? Uh, do you have a timeline and when the, this board needs to take action? Um, really, you need to take it tonight. Um, you know, as I said, <coughs> July first is this weekend. So, um, the stop loss issue we have until sometime in August or actually to get it. Well, I shouldn't say retroactively, but really to get it in place, we have until August. Then again, we can revisit that at the end of the, for 12 months. 12 months in the Just so that um, I do you know what's going on, we're talking about the workman's compensation. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure you probably picked up on that. I'll, yeah. I'll turn the board back over to you. Thank you, and I apologize for being late. Uh, any more questions for Mike? I. Dan, go ahead. I'd like the town administrator's recommendation and a little more discussion on this. Well, I think we've been looking at this for a couple of months now. Um, <clears throat> some of the information um, we were able to gather uh, from our, our current carrier. And uh, at one point, we were thinking about maybe delaying this for a year, but it appears that right now we had enough information to present to the board. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we're talking about, you know, your last meeting in this fiscal year, but um, it was something we felt was important enough to bring to the board's attention uh, right now. And the fact that the savings that Mike had had uh, shared with you folks um, is real. It's real, uh, and it would 
you know, it would definitely save the town some money that we could put us put aside into a trust fund that was a um, first started at the spring town meeting. And that three hundred ten thousand dollars, that's a yearly increment, correct? Is that correct? That's the annual budget. Annual budget. Yeah, okay. last year it was a little less. And then out of that 310 that we're doing by going to this individual, you know, workman's comp for mm -hmm. us taking on a lot of the liability here. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the people out there basically exactly the numbers we're looking at, what we're going to save? No. Like yearly? Yeah. Nothing yet? No. Okay. No. Um, I don't know what's going to happen over the next couple months. I don't know what's going to happen. It's not going to get hurt. The going to be. I can't. I, all I can do, that's why I try to emphasize what's happened over the last three years. So is this something that um, <clears throat> that we could try and not and and go back to something uh, what we had before next year, or is this something? Sure, that, that, that's something um, you can look at every year. You can decide to buy the coverage um, again next year. That may help. I would think at a minimum that would help our experience rate. So yeah, this is something that just like all the other budgets, we should look at every. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, we've been paying 310 a year now, and the cost to, to administer the fund is $18,000, uh, and of course the unknown is any claims that have to be paid out. Sure. So, you know, there's a potential of tremendous savings, the potential to break even, the potential to even lose more. Right. So, one thing I, I'd, I'd want to be leery about is to look at the the total sum difference of 310 from 18 and cook that into the general fund going forward. So I just want want to be cognizant of that. I mean this town meeting's already voted for that, but mm -hmm. in a future town meeting, I don't I don't want someone to uh, use that money uh, for the general fund line items. Right. No, it's very important. <clears throat> Until we build up su sufficient reserves, which will take years, um, both for police and fire and general work is not, um, really this might seem a well. It's really going to pay off four or five years and further up down the road when we have adequate reserves. We can, um, you know, as I said before, the list is about that. And then we can begin to look at the allocated on the voters to capital uh, for all departments and whether it's to uh, certain other issues. So there are two things, excuse me, um, the two things that would be paid out to the employee. One would be medical expenses, and the other is salary. And we've already got the salary budgeted, so that's already in the general fund budget. Because the employee has the choice of either getting a worker's comp check or getting their full salary by taking three, uh, three hours of sick leave. That's a really good point. So. So, <clears throat> of that experience I told you about, over half of that went to salary that we had essentially got paid back for money that we had already got. Um, the exposure really becomes medical and medical expenses. So, that history um, I gave you of an average of $172,000 a year for medical and legal. And how, how does it work out with, um, I know some of these insurance companies, if you change from one insurance company to another insurance company, they say, well, that was something that took place prior, so we're not, we're not covering that. So this new insurance company or whatever, we say somebody got hurt on the job here now and, is, and is, uh, has been injured. So when you change insurance companies, is this going to affect any uh, current employees that that uh, or past employees that that has a claim. Open claim. Well, this won't affect the employees. Employee, employees won't really see this, other than um, the person assigned to manage the case. Um, but to your point, which is a really good question, we have paid for coverage for 12 months, and we have paid for coverage up through June 30th. So anybody who was hurt on June 30th or before, we've already paid for that expense, and maybe is obligated. 
Okay. So because we go out on our own July 1st, and anybody who gets hurt July 1st onward, um, we're responsible for it. doesn't mean the biggest responsibility goes away before you pay for that. Okay. All right. I understand that. <clears throat> so we have a question from the audience. Yeah. It's been a long time. I, I have been involved with the uh, third party administrator with the stop loss. But when we had the stop loss, it was too facet. It was uh, not just for a total claim like the 300000 but it was total claims. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's available and how much that would be. But if it might be, say, 500000 in a year, it would at least cap the total. And I was wondering if you, if you had any idea how much that would be if it's available. Um, I don't know what the cap on the $300,000 policy, but generally there's an individual cap and a, and a global cap. Yeah. Not actually, I shouldn't say cap threshold. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to be honest with you, I haven't had, I wanted to nail this down before I pursued the stop loss. Pursuing the stop loss could have been the way you choose to grow this grade. But we're going to choose this one. Okay. Just to just as background, what normally is they take a three or five year average of what your claims are and they say double that. And put something like that as a stop loss so that if we're getting 200000 a year, they'd say 400000 would be capped because the insurance would cover anything over that as an aggregate. So it would further limit your losses if you had a really bad year. And that would be a su supplemental fund. So I just want to make a quick statement that. The town, town meeting voted to go to the town administrator. It's not official yet. Uh, but the reason we did that is so that we would have uh, administrative input and going forward in the town. And this is what I think I'm seeing here uh, between Mike, town accountant, and town administrator. Uh, they could have done this on their own, but with the, the large risk factor, you brought it to the Board of Selectmen. So I look favorably upon what they've uh, brought forward to us in, in their recommendation. As long as that uh, money that's allocated that we're trying to do now uh, pretty much is earmarked for that. I know basically everything you know, due to Mass General Law usually goes into the general fund. Uh, I just hope that basically with the you know, town administrator and the board that we can make sure that this money is earmarked for the compensation itself because sometimes it gets muddled in the work and or we don't know the public doesn't know what's going on so I just want to make sure that's clear that this is going to be allocated every year in whatever fund it's supposed to be in or if it is in the general fund that it's earmarked for the compensation well, absolutely I think as Mike alluded to earlier the goal is to increase the fund every year so that we have the uh, you know so that maybe Five years from now, um, you would need you'd have enough money in there where you wouldn't have to appropriate money every year for the fund. There would be enough money to be, you know, to sustain. So we wouldn't we wouldn't notice the savings right away. Then we would we would notice the savings somewhere down the line. Then so it would take several years to. Well, your savings would be redirected to your savings account. You would notice the savings that you could spend on other. <clears throat> okay, so it would take a, probably at least three years anyway. Mm -hmm. Mike or Ed, if, if you can clearly state what the action you would like the board to take tonight, and if you would accept the motion, uh, I'll, I'll take that recommendation as a motion. Um. I would ask the board to authorize us to um, engage, well, I can't say, engage the services of a third party administrator to um, explore the town's option for stock loss insurance and beginning July 1st, self insuring co workers' fund. I move town accountant's recommendation. A second. All right, the motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I vote aye as well. Any opposed? Hearing none, it passes unanimously. Thank you for coming in. Thank you.
All right, so it's now 726. So we have a school committee discussion regarding the fiscal year 20 budget process. Thank you for coming in, Pat. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, hi, guys. How are you? Hey, Pat. Um, so right after the election this year, subsequent <laughs> meeting uh, started really talking about uh, the coming fiscal year. So not the one starting July 1, fiscal year 19, but fiscal year 20. Knowing that uh, the override that we had failed, there's a lot of competing interests currently economically. Uh, we really had a tough time coming into this budget cycle. Pretty similarly, I think we've had tough times coming into the probably the last 10 budget cycles that I've been part of. Um, we wanted to get with the five of you and hopefully start to craft a strategy for fiscal year 20 now. Uh, part of this is really throwing out there very early in the game to begin to really understand what is it that we as a town are going to need, where is it that we can draw those resources from, and what and how much short are we going to be. You know, inevitably, we know from the school department perspective, we roll over the budget every year. We brought you guys the slides every single year for many, many years now. Um, you know, and the town has been great. You know, you've kicked in anywhere from 800000 to a $1 million, you know, some years. It's been much less depending on where we were, but we can't go through another budget cycle like we have over the past 10, 12 years, quite honestly. Um, we reduced 11 positions in this latest budget cycle, uh, some of which were enrollment driven, were absolutely the right thing to do, I think the right thing to do on behalf of the town. If we were in that position again, it could be, it will directly impact uh, education, the classroom, uh, all the things that I think we fought to build and protect uh, over the last several years. So what we are hoping to do is really start the dialogue with you guys tonight. There's not going to be an answer. This is going to be a, a, a many month, I think, journey for us to be going on together. One of the things though, that we are hoping you would do tonight or at your, at your next meeting is to form a subcommittee. Uh, you know, we have a budget subcommittee. I've talked to you guys about this a little bit in the past. <coughs> um, that budget subcommittee is solely focused on the annual fiscal year budget rolling it over, getting the data, the facts, and the figures, everything that we bring to you guys in the advisory on an annual basis. But what we are hoping is if two of you could sit on a, a budget subcommittee and meet with the school committee subcommittee committee jointly, you know, at that point it's 50% and 50% on average of the budget, coming together to really figure out what strategy do we have to craft and how do we begin to message to the town exactly where we as a government are um, in order to drive the facts out and understand what our options are going into fiscal year 20. I get the fiscal year 19, uh, and Mike, you're probably like, I can't believe you're talking about fiscal year 20 already, but you know, fiscal year 19 starts in a week. If we don't get out in front of this, we'll be, in my view, um, in really bad shape when it's time to actually go to town meeting next spring. So to avoid that and to take out the strategy to do it jointly, to do it as a team, you know, is, is really what we're, we're hoping to kind of figure out with you guys together. Well, last, last town meeting, we knew we were going to be at this point uh, <coughs> knowing that we would need uh, joint discussions. Uh, and normally what we've been doing is waiting to January to do it. So I'm glad you're coming forward now to, uh, to suggest we, we get on the ball. And one thing that's important for the school committee to know, and, and you're invited, you have a liaison. The Capital Fund Study Committee is meeting tomorrow night uh, to discuss with uh, the town accountant and the town administrator uh, the potential of taking a certain percentage of the budget and using it toward all capital spending. Uh, the the Collins Center uh, gave us a number of 3% is general rule of thumb. So that is, that is a new way of the town of Pembroke to be doing business. Mm -hmm. And according to all the experts, it's the right way. We should be going forward. But there's going to be a big pinch on every department, school department especially, because you're the largest portion of the budget. If we did go that way, um, I'd like to do both. I'd like to be able to fund, fund you for what you need and establish capital fund that's actually funded. 
So one of the things that I thought then, and I think it's even more important then, why it has to, there needs to be um, at least a joint meeting of the school committee and the board of selectmen, right? That makes up our government because uh, I, in in regular times, I would completely agree with the strategy, right? I mean, you have to set a certain amount of your budget and percentage of your budget to the side in order to fulfill capital needs, in order to fulfill maintenance needs. And, and look, this isn't about a, a, a school budget issue. This is about a town of Pembroke budget issue. We have a budget issue, and it's significant. We have had a budget issue for a long time, and it's been building for a long, long time. And we're at the point where we just, it, it, we can't collectively kick the can down the road. We have to solve this problem. So while a 3% set aside for uh, capital funding and for capital projects, I think it's great. But we also have to figure out how to fund the needs of government today and figure out how we're going to move forward with funding the needs of government. You know, every year we sit here and I, and I hear the same thing. Over, not from you guys, right? But I, I do, I hear the same thing of, well, did you apply for a grant? And do we have these, this grant fund here? Did we look at this? We, we have collectively, I know we have. You know, the chief just walked in. I know he's, he's looked at every grant and every funding mechanism he can get. This isn't a school issue. It's not a police issue. It's not a fire issue. I leave DPW out of this because I think they had other funding mechanisms that they thought maybe they could ultimately get in this last go around. But this is a town of government. This is a town of Pembroke government issue. And I think we have to come together now to figure out the strategy. And part of the strategy is it's definitely capital funding. I mean, I completely agree with you, right? It, it's absolutely capital funding. But it's not about taking funds that are in the general fund today and moving that and taking 3% away and moving them over um, for capital expenditures. Because quite honestly, 3% of nothing is nothing. I mean, that, that's the reality. And I'm not saying that a $64 million budget isn't nothing, right? But we have a unique issue within our town. Where we are socioeconomically, where we are from a local funding and state aid perspective, I mean, you guys have seen the charts over and over again, right? Our state funding grows at an anemic percentage year over year. It's 1% one, 1 to less than 1%. Our expenses do not grow at less than 1% every year. So every year we slash that amount from the budget. And we've been doing it now for 10 plus years. We have to have a definitive economic strategy and a communication strategy, a change management strategy, a couple of contingency options, and, and really be able to move forward to explain to the residents of the town, this is where we are and why. This is fundamentally what the next economic steps in this town need to be, or this is what government looks like, right? And then ultimately the residents decide. I'll always be all for the residents making that determination. But we have to start now, I think, for next May. And if we don't, it's going to get away from us again. And, and I don't see us, and I've never said this before, right? I'm going into my 12th year. I've never come to you in June to have this conversation. But in my view, I do not see an ability for this town to effectively manage and balance its fiscal year 20 budget without there being some adjustments and changes from a revenue perspective. And if we're unable to put forward that strategy today and, and move that forward over the next couple of months to begin to explain it to people, to begin to have the hearings, I, I think we could be in trouble. Not me to be doom and gloom. I just think that's the reality of where we are. Well, I think it's it's absolutely correct to say that all all town departments have been running lean. Uh, matter of fact, public safe public safety uh, has been running leaner than than they believe they should. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the school has been on the knife's edge of running as lean as you can. Uh, so every department has been. There's no more fat to trim. Okay. So what what we need to do is set a budget that that can allow for the services that the people want and the people need, the people people deserve. Okay. It, the only way to do that 
is to increase revenues. And the only way to increase revenue is to, is, is, an, is an override. And I think if that's, if that is the only way, then this committee that, that, that you're suggesting should come up with all, all the reasons to justify that. Uh, and you alluded to it. Uh, make, let the public know, here's, here's where we are, here's why we're here, and uh, this is why increasing the, the revenues is a good idea for everyone. So I, I, th I think you're right on track with, with suggesting that. And, and I guess what, what I'm trying to suggest is just because of the way local government is divided, you know, with the schools owning and operating a certain portion of the budget, the town owning and operating a certain portion of the budget, our two boards collectively, you know, make up that government. And I think we're not going to have the answers, right? I mean, we're going to have to bring people in. We're going to have to have conversations with the chief of police and the fire chief and the DPW boards. It's going to have to be a collaborative collective, but I think it has to start with our two boards. And I think getting the budget subcommittee of the school committee and hopefully a newly formed subcommittee of um, the board of selectmen together, we can at least start to, first of all, figure out where are we, right? from a financial and economic perspective, where are we, right? We'll bring in advisory in, in, the, in the various expertise and advisory. We'll bring people in you know, to present and understand where we are, but it's gonna help form, I think, at least a strategy that gives us a fighting chance at at least setting a revenue target that's necessary without it being overly rich or, or or un, you know, unnecessary, quite honestly. But you know, just getting to a point where we have the right strategy to move forward, not just for this year, but at least for the next couple of years, and make it sustainable. So um, I guess really what I'm asking you guys to do is to consider that subcommittee in, in the joint meetings between the two subcommittees to begin to flesh this out and move that forward. And I, I'm springing this on you, right? I mean, I, you know, obviously, so it's something that I think you guys as a board have to debate. But, Yes, Ed, the, the Collins Center uh, study on the town, uh, when will that be issued? Oh, it's, it's, we have the, the uh, report. We, we have, <laughs> you're, we have the report. About, you're talking about the one that was presented uh, by um, uh, the Collins Center to, in front of you folks. Right, the report, mm -hmm. and, and they were going to take the, the spreadsheet that they developed uh, specific to the town uh, and input all the data and that way we can find out where the town is now is is that ready is that up and running yeah and we have the, we have it Mike that that piece is ready the capital um, is it a capital study that we're going to engage them with that has oh that's the second part yeah, it was like a capital budget yeah the, the first one was the five-year forecast mm -hmm. the revenue and expenditure forecast and that was the one that spells a lot of doom for 2020, especially. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but yeah, uh, Mike and I have been talking, and I've been talking with the, the director, uh, Steve McGoldrick, about uh, the second part of it, which would be the capital improvements plan. And I and I was able to can uh, get um, DOR to transfer five thousand dollars from the first grant that we got for the Collins Center to the capital improvements plan. And then you know we'll work on that. But uh, but the information that the Collins Center presented to you folks is available. Okay, and that's important because that's that's data that this committee will need. Sure, it's it's, hard. Right. it's, it's where we are from a third party. Yeah, sure. And so I I agree, right? I mean I think the more information that we can gather to, that we can gather and kind of comb through and go through, right, the more questions I think that we can ask and and really kind of start to turn over every rock imaginable, whatever pun we want to use, right? At the end of the day, though, we as a team have got to come together to set a strategy that can be executed, whether it's the Collin Center information, whether it's the DOR information, candidly, whether it's, you know, some really good business people in town that are going to offer some of their talents. It really doesn't matter, but we have to cohesively execute on a strategy. And we have to do it, I think, soon, right? I mean, it's, look, 
collectively in this room, there are hundreds of years of government experience in this town, right? We have the ability to figure this out. We've got to put our heads together ultimately to do it. And if the answer is to generate additional revenues through an override, plus potentially a sale of real estate, plus you know potentially some sort of TIF, I, I don't know exactly what all of the items and issues are, uh, or all of the answers are. You know what a lot of the issues are. Um, but we need to vet some of those things out, right? And, and approach every potential revenue source available because it's part of the explanation. And it's part of, I think, going to the town. John, did you have your hand up? No, no, no. no, no. Oh, I do. Go ahead. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned the sale of land, and that's a possibility, certainly, but it's only a one time uh, revenue hit. Um, how do we get the message across? And I, I don't mean to single out the um, Zoning Board of Appeals, but they let $50,000 in uh, signage slip through the uh, fingers of the town. Um, you know, and that's in a $64 million budget. That's not a lot of money, but it's it's certainly a step in the right direction. It's a teacher, it's a firefighter, it's a, yeah, it's, yeah, it's right. So how do we approach um, <clears throat> So I, what I will say, and now I'm just drawing on our experience right over the years, Arthur, um, but when budget sub meets, we bring people um, from throughout uh, the school system into the meetings, right? And we walk through, here's what the needs are, here's what we believe you're going to need, here's where we are, here are the things that we're, we're designing, right? Do you make a reduction here? Do you make a reduction here? And sometimes it's two really bad choices. I think you have to bring the chairman of the zoning board in and literally lay out that we've got to start to generate additional revenues and this is where we are and these are the consequences of not doing it. Um, I also think it's about educating the rest of government about where we are, right? And educating candidly even each other a little bit about where we are in, in the decisions that, that we're ultimately making. So. That takes time, I think it takes involvement, I think it takes bringing in those other pieces of government to make sure they understand what ramifications those decisions ultimately have. Um, especially when, you know, that same signage might only be about two blocks down the street and another town is getting the fifty-five, fifty thousand dollars as a result of it. So I, I do think those things have to be pushed a little more. And candidly, I think we also can review what our abilities are and what the, this collective board's abilities are to maybe make some of those determinations and decisions in the town. You know, whether it be from bylaw changes or, or what have you. But, you know, what I found doing this on the school committee for many years now is it's not a quick fix, right? Which is why I'm suggesting starting now, you know, a year, literally almost a year out from when the budget's going to get presented. Um, as opposed to starting in January. So we got to push it. I volunteer. I'll volunteer also. Yeah, that's great. That's up to you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> oh, do you need to take a vote on that, Ed? Or is that just a decision on me? Oh, you can take a vote. Yeah. I move that we appoint John Brown and Dan Trapuco to the uh, <laughs> subcommittee. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Vote aye as well. Any opposed? Hearing none. Congratulations. Thanks, guys. Um, we'll be in touch. Well, I think that's it. Uh, since I finally have a question, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now, we have to, since we were trying to find all these other solutions to help out the school committee of whatever source of revenue may be, uh, the school committee and the residents were really good when that $1.3 million had to go through uh, several years back. And the communication was phenomenal. And the, but after the fact, it seems like that the school committee followed, I mean, fell off a little bit. Only reason why I know more, probably because I'm the only one who has kids in the system still. So can you ex explain that basic, the communication part of it to, you blast me all the time, I get it, I can go out and do anything I want. How are you going to get the other residents on board without, I guess, hurting yourself for budget-wise, too, saying communication, G Gmail's free, or you know, Facebook is, is free for the time being. How are we really going to be blasting that out on uh, 
uh, besides those. As those far as, you mean as far as the economic message goes? Yes, exactly, um, as people well, want to know. Well, so if you go back to the $1.3 million override, right, um, about four years ago when, when that went through and, and we pushed out there, uh, the school community, we have on average, and to be honest here, 15 budget hearings a year, right? We literally go building by building, department by department, and we get down into the, here are the priorities, here are the things that we don't have to do year on year, and here's what, you know, basically, uh, here's what we can add, and here's what we have to reduce. And more often than not, lately it's been, here's what, what we ultimately have to reduce. So we have 15 different meetings around budget, just in a school committee setting, between November and April, and then we have a legally required public budget hearing uh, in April before a town meeting. We also have a series of budget subcommittee meetings, which is why I was suggesting that subcommittee be formed. And those budget subcommittee meetings occur outside of the regular, um, the regular school committee. Now, when we were moving forward for an override, there was a group of uh, parents that actually galvanized and advocated for that override. We had 21 public hearings on the budget. The first time we did it, one person came, one. And we went through the entire thing for that one person, and I sat and answered their questions um, for that individual, as did the superintendent at the time and our current superintendent. By the time we were on our 21st meeting, we had about 50 or 60 people in there, right? And it's about taking the message out. It's not about expecting, I think, the people that come here, but it's about pushing that message out and honestly, the first couple of times, there's one or two. You know, and then it grows and it grows and it grows. If we've fallen off on communicating, I'll absolutely look at that. I mean, I'm always open to more communication, um, whether it be through the website or, or through other means. I mean, we are by no means perfect. Uh, but I will say, having all of those different hearings and having all of those different meetings and those public meetings, definitely helps. Now, the reality is when things are good, not a lot of people come, right? When things aren't good, a lot more people come in, you know, to the concern of what goes up. Does that answer your question? Uh, it does, and also uh, our legislative members, you know, with the unfunded mandates that we have to deal with, one as a town, also you as a school yep. committee, uh, would you be able to tell the public more about that right now, sure. what, what we're going through? Sure. So. Um, we actually have um, State Senator DiMacito and um, Representative Cutler into our school committee meeting at least once a year, sometimes more. Um, and we offer them a whole variety of suggestion on how they can help towns like Pembroke, right? So what we've been pushing for quite a bit is vocational transportation. So we're mandated by the Commonwealth to provide transportation to vocational students. Um, that is to the tune of how much would you say? Dollars a year. We get no reimbursement for that, right? So there's not a circuit breaker like there is when you get reimbursement in special education, which is just a fraction of what you spend. There's nothing. So we made we made the suggestion to them a couple of years in a row now. Could you introduce legislation allowing us to at least get some form of reimbursement back? Um, our unfunded mandates, if when you add in everything from uh, you know, special education to vocational tuition, because keep in mind, a student in Pembroke can choose to go to a vocational program and we are legally required to pay that tuition. Now, vocational programs are, are wonderful for kids. We need more of them, in my opinion. Um, but what ends, up, what ends up happening is you have a $16,000 tuition when your average per pupil spend is like $11,000. You lose $5,000. You know, for each one of those kids. Now, we've made a couple of policy changes and a couple of requirements to bring that more in line uh, while still fulfilling the, the spirit of the law. Um, but those are just a couple of, you know, unfunded mandates. There's a whole series of things that come before the legislature every year. There was a civics um, thing that came before the legislature this past year um, in, in a specific requirement for which I did Senator Dumas a lot of credit. He really tried to push funding um, in with that. The civics piece passed, the funding piece failed, right? So we deal with that as a school system to the tune of millions of dollars every single year. Uh, it's no different on the town side. There's a series of unfunded mandates 
could be getting hit with all the time. Right, well, definitely. This is what I wanted you to, to tell the public this because, and especially if you're suggesting to our legislative people and not having it in writing, unfortunately, sometimes it gets by the wayside. <clears throat> Yeah, and we, we have definitely sent letters to um, both of, of our representatives. I mean, the reality is, is this, and it's something that I learned the hard way probably five or six years ago sitting in the Pembroke High School um, auditorium when we had the legislators in, and we were going through some really difficult times. I mean, there was, it was actually a packed hall, and those guys got blasted pretty hard, and we were amongst the group that was blasting them pretty hard. But the reality is this. A suburban district, school district, in a suburban community is always going to get the fuzzy end of the lollipop, right? We, we, you hear about things like Boston, and this is when I just became unglued, saying, well, it's only $17 million to extend our school day. What's the big deal? And I'm like, that, that is literally half of my entire budget. That's just to extend the school day, and that's not a big deal. It, unfortunately, the urban legislative core of Beacon Hill has enough votes and, a, and enough um, pull, but that's the reality is that's not going to change. State funding is not changing anytime soon. I just don't want it to go down at this point. I prefer that it go up a little bit. Right? On average, we get about seventy-five dollars to $80,000 more year on year on a budget that costs about $2 million to roll over. Right? <clears throat> but where I think we need to get to is everyone in this room needs to be as versed as I can be on the school budget to the town budget in total, myself included, by the way. You know, understanding what the chief's needs are, understanding what the fire chief's needs are, understanding what the DPW needs are, even better than I already do. And I think we all have to get there. I'm hoping that these teams come together and will get us there. Other questions? And if you think I'm off base, I'm okay having that conversation too. But we do, I think we need to do something. Well, I think it's, I think it's coming from a good place because the, the school committee has a budget subcommittee that's been in place. You have a routine. Um, so that's a, that's a great place to, to start a new committee. Uh, so we, we, we begin with structure. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. No, that's when's, the, when's the first meeting? So next week. July 4th, my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll have the superintendent uh, reach out, but uh, we'll get a budget sub uh, committee uh, meeting on the docket, and then we will get a joint budget sub meeting on the docket. We've been planning it out. And I appreciate you guys signing up to do this so quickly. I actually didn't expect you to vote on it tonight, so I really do appreciate it. Well, I'm available all summer, so. <laughs> yes, my my wife's going to kill me either way. <laughs> she knows the schools are important. Careful what you wish for. My wife says we can meet in our house, so she told me that would be okay. <laughs> thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks. All right, next up we have a 7.30 appointment with Kyle Harney for a request for fireworks funding <coughs> of Pembroke Salutes Service. Thank you for coming in, Kyle. Hi. Mine's positively, you know, fluff compared to what we've been talking about. This is uh, very educational. <clears throat> I'm actually representing Kathleen Keegan tonight, so um, I'm the poor man's Kathleen Keegan. I want to give you some of our numbers that we have um, <coughs> already for our Pembroke Celebrates, which was we renamed the event Pembroke Celebrates as a celebration of the town and all of the people who work uh, so hard to make it such a great place to live. Um, what we would like to do is to put on fireworks show. The uh, town is not well, so we wanted to take that under our wing, and this is a group of uh, citizens completely in, um, independent of the town. Uh, there might be some people that work for the town or on the community, but only in so that way. Um, $9,000 will give us a respectable fireworks show. Um, we seek 15000 not from you, but that's our total budget. 15000 will give us a fantastic show that would be on par with the last two years as well as the 300th anniversary fireworks. Uh, approximately last year, we had a thousand people at the event. We had a tailgate event, and then we had the fireworks afterwards. The band played. It was a very wholesome, family fun evening. We had great weather until the fireworks, and then the fog rolled in. Um, we didn't pay the fog bill, I guess. So um, uh, we've already raised this year uh, forty-two hundred dollars. 
and we have uh, fundraisers going um, throughout the summer. We have another $1,500 that is pledged uh, toward that grand amount of 15000 that we want to raise. Um, the fundraisers uh, are monthly. Um, what it is is it's a board of scratch tickets um, at five local restaurants. They're going to be at the um, Alumni, the uh, BBC, Arrow, Christina's, and the Lucky Dog. Where people could buy a chance for five dollars, you can buy a hundred dollars worth of scratch tickets. So you could become a millionaire, and then you could pay for the whole firework. Um, and let's see, uh, we're going to do a drawing at the end of June and then end of July as well. Um, we appreciate any assistance the town can give. Um, you know, I know you guys have been very generous to us, and we've come hat in hand to uh, for the tree lighting and for um, uh, you know other events and. Uh, we are very, very, very grateful for anything that the selectmen can do. Um, but I understand the budgets are tight. Can we answer any questions for you? Go ahead. Uh, have you also asked uh, chamber members? We did have a meeting with the chamber a few months ago. Um, I'm also in the chamber, so kind of incestuous <laughs> all of the different things that we do at home. But um, uh, we've just found that the goals for Pembroke Day, which is the Chamber's event, and the goals for Pembroke Celebrates are a little different. Um, what we want to do is we want to get enough money in our kitty to be able to not have to come to you and ask you for money. We want to raise money for the fireworks. And, by, and then in the event, we would have the fireworks, and then that would actually pay for the fireworks for the next year. Um, and we also uh, have tables at other events in town. Um, the Chamber, Pembroke Day is a, is a charity event. They choose a charity and they want to give a sizable amount. So by cutting up that pie into so many different pieces and saying, oh, okay, Pembroke celebrates is going to get part and the Chamber is going to get part, it makes a piddly donation to an uh, individual charity for the Chamber and it doesn't really service us well either. So we thought it'd be better to set that event. If I could just add to that, uh, the 1500 that's been pledged is from chamber members yeah. that, that they've reached out to. So they are cooperating. You know, it was a very amiable meeting. I mean, it was, you know, everybody was, we were just trying to all be really in the same direction. And there were several chamber members that had not contributed before that decided to step up, so it was very good. And also, have you checked with the corporate entities in town? Such um, as 99, Lowe's, you name it. People yeah. that may see that are all over this nation. <laughs> Put it that no, way. That, that's something we definitely need to um, to do. And then we also have a program also, um, you may have seen typos on it. Um, it's um, our blast off uh, sponsorships. That's, those are higher donations um, for 250, 500, and 1,000. But that's small potatoes compared to what you're talking about, I imagine, right? They're, they're here, you know, but they, a lot of them have these, especially on their applications, of helping out the town or events. So, I mean, it's definitely another avenue to go with. I, I agree completely. And I would, I, you know, we're, we're not a little, we're a very small committee. Um, we're the Pembroke Fund Committee, where fund is our middle name. So, we can't have fundraising without fun. Uh, but we have the chief on board, so uh, that's good to have him uh, on our side. And, uh, it's a really great event. I don't know if you've ever, if you've all attended it. It's, it's just like a Norman Rockwell painting um, with foggy fireworks. <clears throat> so, um, but I definitely want to, you know, pursue those. Things. So, if you reached your goal of nine thousand dollars to have an adequate fireworks, mm -hmm. uh, that'd get you solid. You know you have a fireworks. And perhaps knowing that and the certainty of it could garner more donations. Yes. Every year, you know, we tweak the event a little bit each year, and it's gotten big, bigger and bigger and bigger. Last year, was a, we had, a, like I said, over a thousand people there. And it was a great event <clears throat> until the fog came out, uninvited. <laughs> so you have 4,200 in hand, uh, aside from the pledge. You have in hand 4,200. So if you had 4,800 more, that'd get you to in 9,000. Ed, Ed, 
could you speak to the Camp Pembroke fund and if uh, 4,800 or an even 5,000 uh, would be available? Um, why don't I suggest to the board that this be on your July 9th agenda and we'll have a number about that. So Kyle, you're talking about a minimum, you you need 9,000, so Dan is correct saying right. the right. difference right now is 4,800, right. And we'd like to have no fog. <laughs> I agree so, with that. Can I uh, put move it on the table. July 9th? Move the table until July mm -hmm. 9th. Does that work? That's fine with me. Okay, second. All righty, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye as well. Any opposed? You are none. My table is to July 9th. Thank you for coming Thank in. Thank you. Thank you guys for your continued support with uh, this great event. Thank you. All right, that concludes the three scheduled appointments for tonight. Uh, we do have a few audience members, so I would like to take the Ask the Selectman part of the meeting out of order. Uh, Lou, did you have any voice? I do, but it's a little later on. Oh, okay. Has any, was anybody else here for Ask the Selectman? Chief? All right. So we'll move on to the board action items, the first of which being review of senior abatement statistics and data. So, Lou, is that uh, what you're here for? Yes, it is. <laughs> I thought you might be speaking first. <laughs> Thank the board for uh, giving me the time. I'm here to uh, speak, if I may, for the 150 people who last year applied for an abatement on their trash and were accepted, and they paid 50% of the trash fee, which equals $140. Now, as the board knows, the budget was approved for next year for about $1.7 million to fund the trash program. And the trash fee of $280 was not raised. So I was puzzled when I tuned in a little late at your last meeting and you were discussing uh, cutting back on the abatement amount to the 150 people who we're anticipating will file again and be approved. Um, so the $280 trash fee that about 6,000 families pay and the 150 people that pay with their abatement approval of $140 equals about $1.7 million, which funds the program. So, um, having said all that, um, I understand that they, uh, there was a couple of other issues that uh, I tuned in late on the meeting I didn't get a chance to see. But um, I am here tonight to ask the Board of Selectmen to revert back to the usual plan that was agreed many years ago, that if uh, people can uh, meet the specifications and get approval for an abatement, pay 50% of the current trash fee. So that means for next year there would be no change. Um, and just so that the public may want to know, if uh, you're 70 years of age or over, and you're one person living in your home, uh, you cannot earn more than $32,000 a year. If you're living in a house with a spouse, your income uh, can rise to qualify to $36,000. So I think we can all agree we're not talking about folks who have an overabundance of money. But they need to have their trash and recycling taken care of. So I think this program that we put into place many years ago, which included the abatement program as I've described. If 150 people submit an application, it gets reviewed by the Board of Selectmen's office, and if they approve it, I think they should go back and they should keep with their 50% of the current trash fee. 
So if you don't need to raise the fee, you don't need the money. So I'm asking the board to keep the plan the way I described it. 50% of the trash fee, which this year equals $140. Thank you for the time. Thanks for coming in. Ed, can you mm -hmm. talk about the, the, the reason we, we uh, made the decision we made? Well, if you remember the conversation that you had with the, the treasurer collector, she talked about how um, there were certain uh, obligations that uh, residents in the town uh, have to pay regarding uh, debt service and uh, the um, operation of the recycling center. And that uh, in itself would be equal to uh, the half of the trash fee, which is the $140. Um, I know that um, um, there's a report that we have that states that the um, trash fee, even if it was cut in half, uh, that probably the most the uh, fee for abatements for seniors would be, uh, I know that the board voted $200 uh, at their last meeting, that it would be um, in the $180 range. The um, So, and and Mr. Stone is correct that, you know, we we're actually raising the the trash fee for seniors, but not for anybody else. Um, uh, that it, that's correct. Although we did never assign um, any trash fees for seniors that qualify uh, over 70 and the income uh, threshold that uh, Lou mentioned. So. Um, you know, like I said, right now it, it has increased from 140 for the senior abatements to 200 that was voted on by the board a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's, that's where it stands right now from a, uh, a monetary standpoint. Uh, so there was a committee that it was yourself treasurer collector uh, who else it was a couple of folks here at town hall that that got together and, and discussed this fee and the structure of the fee was it you kathleen and mike was well i think uh, it was more kathleen than it was and myself yeah um because we you know we're reorganizing uh uh the trash situation and uh, basically the billing and abatement process uh, we'll go over to the treasurer collector's office. Right. And, and what was brought before this, this board was that the, the seniors rate should be 210. And uh, after some discussion, uh, the board wanted to uh, help a little bit for the, for the seniors and, and brought it down uh, to a total of 200 after the abatement. Uh, so we were presented with 210 and we asked them to cut it down to 200 and then there was uh, there was a little consternation on your face if uh, if the budget could hold that yeah I think the the board asked us if uh, you know what the savings would be for uh, if we reduced it from uh, 210 to uh, 200 and it was fifteen hundred dollars um, you know, for the 150 people that uh, apply for the abatement. Um, so, I, I mean, we didn't change any other abatements uh, that we have right now. And uh, I think it was, uh, you know, based on the uh, recommendation that the treasurer collector made that, uh, that the, uh, the people getting the senior abatements would uh, pay for, you know, part of the curbside trash and recycling pickup. What's the current amount now that everybody else pays? 280. Pardon? 280. 280. And my understanding was, Ed, pretty much, if the seniors getting 140, they were pretty much paying for pickup and not disposal. 
that's kind of how I took it, just kind of to, to <coughs> let other people know this is what's happening. Yeah. Well, now, the 140 pays for retiring the debt to close the landfill that town council stated that everybody should pay. Um, it also goes towards uh, operating the recycling center that people can take advantage of. Um, so that the other $140 is what we charge individuals for curbside trash and recycling pickup. All right, uh, Lou, I believe you had another question. <clears throat> uh, I certainly understand what you're all saying. I would just like to make the point again that uh, charging $200 to a person who qualifies for a rebate that's making between $32,000 and $36,000 a year is about a 35% increase in their trash fee. And we are not looking for more money according to the budget. So we would be getting $30,000 if this was put into place at $200. And we would be getting $21,000 if it stayed at 140 with 150 people paying. So my point is, that is a $9,000 difference. Usually the town can find a lot of reasons why we need $9,000. But in the case of funding the trash program, we don't need it. Because the budget was approved and we're funding the budget under the old rule. You, you voted to change that at the last time. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I think I need a little help here. So I believe that uh, Selectman Boyle did not vote in favor of that raise. And I wonder what Selectman Boyle might want to say about this program. I don't want to put you on the spot, Arthur. Well, but I need a little help here. And I'm glad to help you out. Um, I voted against it because um, it was already there and budgeted. It was a done deal as part of the uh, budget itself. So it was kind of an unnecessary exercise. And to give somebody back $10 on a $200 bill is a nice thought, but it, it's, um, you know, really a drop in the bucket. Um, what I would suggest, um, if my colleagues are at all interested, is, um, either Dan or the chairman or John would have to move reconsideration to um, get it back in front of us because they were on the prevailing side. Bill was uh, in Utah and I voted um, in the negative, so I, I, can't, um, I can't move it. So what I'd, what I'd like to do is first hear Bill's thoughts since he, since he wasn't here, and secondly, if, uh, if, if we're not certain tonight, if we can refer it back to Ed and Kathleen, who studied this and brought it before us, to take another look at it. But I'd like to hear Bill's thoughts, since uh, he didn't have a chance to speak last time. Well, just looking at it now, I think that I'd have to agree with that um, with and Lou, is that it's already been budgeted. I wouldn't see why um, you would so much as penalize uh, the elderly because they can't afford it, um, and it comes up as a, um, it, it comes up as that's what we've been doing. If the trash fee goes up, their fee automatically goes up anyway because it's 50%. So if we change our uh, trash fee next year and the trash fee goes up to $300 um, for whatever reason, they're, they're still going to have to pay 50%. Um, of whatever they qualify for. So uh, if there's only that amount of people that are out there that are, that are not making that much money, um, I think I would be in favor of keeping it um, at the 
for them to pay the 50 percent that's the way i would feel about it it's uh i mean uh, there's probably a lot of money to those people that aren't making you know thirty two thousand dollars a year it's uh, uh and like i said it's an increase for them and it's no increase for anybody else so i think if we need the money um, then we should raise the trash fee for everybody so, so don't do it he, for the elderly. hearing hearing that said uh, i'll move reconsideration of the previous vote I'll second it. You don't have to be on the prevailing side to second it. All righty. There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye as well. Any opposed? Uh, no. Um, no other questions before us? No other questions before us. I think we can do better. We'll take another look into it. Thank you for coming in. Mike. Yeah, just sure. chopping up a little bit. Um, sure. One thing that's become apparent over the last next couple last couple of weeks and months is that there is a strong likelihood that we will have to increase the trash budget in October at the next time meeting. That's because recycling has shifted from a money maker to a money, uh, money taker. I uh, didn't mean that. Um, <clears throat> however, that said, by no means uh, <clears throat> is anyone recommending that um, the, the fee structure be based change in the rate to uh, for the seniors to make up for recycling. Two independent, two separate questions. Two independent issues, two separate questions. I think what the board needs to decide philosophically is do you want seniors under the income thresholds that you stated to get 50% off of the total bill? Or do you want seniors to be responsible like everyone else for 100 percent of the fixed costs and they get 50 percent off of the variable cost of the bill. I think that's what the board needs to decide. That any of us could sit down and do the math on that and it comes up to anywhere between 170 to 210 dollars uh, on what seniors should pay if you take the second approach that I said. But of course anybody can do the math and show them 50 percent um, of the whole cost is One more thing before you go. What is the current cost of disposing of recyclables? The last that you've seen. Um, it depends on it depends on the item, um, but I would, we were making upwards of fifty thousand dollars a year on it, and now we're going to project for eighteen. We could end up paying um, almost twice that amount. Who knows what the market's going to be? Our uh, our trash contract uh, disposal costs are fixed. Uh, goes up two and a half percent every year. Uh, right now, we're paying uh, fifty-seven dollars a ton to dispose of trash. The latest recycling bill that we got from waste management in Avon is now sixty dollars a ton. So we're paying more to dispose of recyclables than we are trash, uh, and it's risen dramatically. As Mike suggested, we were getting paid less than a year ago for recyclables, and it continued to climb $10, $20, $30, now it's up to 60 and it actually, and, that, and that's that way nationwide. You know, it's not just Pembroke's problem, it's, it's that way nationwide. So does that make sense to look at, at um, single stream recycling instead of having um, recyclables in one bin and, well, that, and that, trash that, in another that, bin? That's the same thing about, you know, I think one of the things that we may want to look at going forward, and some towns are thinking about doing this, I know the town of Plymouth's doing it at the transfer station, is that they are taking, they're separating out those that will generate income. Um, cardboard and paper are commodities that will generate revenue. So we may want to look at that separating cardboard and paper from the reset uh, the rest of the recyclables um and that's something that uh, you know in, in talking to uh our good friend gordon martin who ran wellesley's situation for years um about that very thing and that may be something that we may um 
may look at uh, between now and whatever time it would make if at Mike's suggestion we need to raise the garbage rate. Yeah. And, and that's what's driving up the cost right now is the, the cost of recyclables. Now, recyclables account for about 26 percent of the total tonnage. Um, but, you know, we're going from having budgeted 30000 for disposal cost recyclables, and I think right now we've, pro we've spent over 47000 I think. Um, and with maybe with maybe two months to go so yeah this is this is more than a, a, a Pembroke issue it, as you said and uh, the, the town of Plymouth's trash hauler just quit reneged on the contract because of recycling because they they had a they had a s solid price for the recycling and they asked the town to re renegotiate with them and the town refused to rene renegotiate with them, so the hauler just reneged on his contract. And now they have to scramble to try to find uh, a new hauler, a new situation uh, for them. Mr. It, Chairman? Um, sure. I'm glad this subject came up. I had intended to ask the board to have a discussion on this particular issue. The problem is people are not properly recycling. And what's happening is, when you take your recyclables to a plant, there's so many non-recyclables mixed in that there's labor hours and breakdowns of equipment, you wouldn't believe the stuff that gets thrown in there. So the public has to get back to doing recycling the way they should. And the way the market has changed, it goes back to that very fact that people are mixing in trash. And China has now changed their policy that they're going to severely limit uh, products that get sent to them because they have to separate after, the, the, after they're separated at the recyclable plant, they're further recyclable over in China. And they've got tons of rubbish over there where they shouldn't have it. So unfortunately, this is a people issue. Now, the market is always going to change. And, and there's no guarantee that recyclable products tomorrow aren't going to bring the money they're bringing today. But it's a handling issue. So um, I don't like the idea of maybe just going to trash like the town of Plymouth did. I know why they did it, and to them it made financial sense. But how do you get back to it again? We need to recycle. And uh, we just can't afford to throw everything in trash. So it is a problem. It is an issue. And as Ed said, we might have to look at raising the trash fee, you know, in the future. It's not raised for next year, but maybe the year after. I, I don't think we know. But what I'd like to say about that is, if we raise the trash fee to whatever the number is, leave the abatement process alone. And the people that qualify will still want to contribute, but it should be at 50% or whatever the trash fee is. So. Uh, we could go on and on on this subject, and I, I don't mean to go any further. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming in. All right, and that concludes the discussion on that. We're moving on to consider a vote. Excuse me. Did, did the board want to vote? Need any on? decisions on that? Are we going to put it off? Are we going to vote on it tonight? Or? We vote to reopen it. To reopen it. And yeah. I thought we were going to take another look into it with Ed and perhaps well, Kathleen. Well, that's the my, discussion. My that's the discussion that's on the table still. Okay. Um, so I had, I had a thought of asking the subcommittee to look at it one more time. If, the, if someone on the board had a had a thought of voting tonight, that's that's your prerogative to discuss that as well. Do you want it on the agenda for July the ninth? That's fine. Yeah, it can be a chance to talk to Kathleen. <coughs> and Mike. Okay. July the ninth it is. 
Do we need a vote on that? No, you can set it as chairman. Yeah. Okay. That's good. There's a TP show in this, I think, for red, though, <coughs> on the recyclables and the cost of disposing of them. Blue's right. China is the biggest driver in all of this. Good point. All right, we're moving on to consider a vote to reappoint unpaid board, committee, and commission candidates. Of which we have four, and I'll list them now. Sue Allen Hewitt for the Council on Aging, for a term expiring in 2021. James Kin Cade, also on the Council on Aging, also the term will expire in 2021. Kyle Harney of the Cultural Council, his term will expire in 2021. And lastly, Emily Norman <coughs> of the Town Landing Committee in the term will expire in 2021. Mr. Chairman, move to uh, reappoint uh, all four to the uh, prospective uh, uh, reappointments uh, to the committees to 2021. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye as well. Any opposed? Hearing none, they're passed unanimously back onto the boards. Next, we will be on to the consideration of a vote to reappoint annual paid positions, for which we have the animal, animal control officer, William Hart, and whose term will expire in 2019. I'll make a note that all these terms expire in 2019. We also have the animal inspector, Lisa Collidy, emergency management co-director, Chief Richard Wall, the other emergency management co-director, Chief J. Michael Hill, the sealer of weights and measures, Joseph Suppa, the town clock winder, Robert Hines, town council, KP Law, PC, and the veterans service office slash veterans agent, Robin Kernan. Mr. Chairman, um, <coughs> move to um Vote the annual paid uh, reappointments uh, as, as stated. Uh, before we take that vote, Mr. Chairman, uh, can I get clarification on the animal inspector and also the emergency match co director? Uh, the chief lawyer here. Um, do you mind coming up? And just put that up? I'm just concerned because it's a paid position. It's since they are being paid by the town as employees, is that double dipping? Good question. So, you know, it's 10 years. I just got it. Somebody that's been doing it for 10 years before me. And know if there was an issue or not. Never been, uh, been asked. No. no, I think that's why they do the um, special employees, where they vote special employees, which uh, that's what you fall under. There's a special employee that special you're able to do that. Special municipal employee status next week or next month. What's that? Special municipal employee status. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he has it from the previous vote a year ago. Works, but, uh, you know, just never, the issue's never been brought up. Right. Well, like I said, since being town employees, like I said, same thing I know with uh, Lisa Cullity, same thing with animal inspector, she's the health inspector. Mm -hmm. So is that part of the same job? I May mean, I understand, because emergency management is, there's a line item in our budget right. for emergency management for you and Chief Hill as the co-directors. There's a whole separate budget. Yeah. Right. Each job description includes yeah. the other. It, it, there's... These these are these are under separate statutes. Okay. From, so the emergency management, uh, the emergency management uh, is a, a separate statute than uh, the, the police department. Mm -hmm. And the the logical people to have as the emergency management directors, uh, the police fire chiefs. So it's it's separate and apart from their job. So it's it's a, a separate job within the town. It's not it's not an additive automatically to the chief. Uh, he's appointed yearly by the board, and uh, Lisa Cullity as animal inspector. Uh, the, we had a, a separate animal inspector that was not the health agent. Um, and when that health when that animal inspector uh, could no longer perform her duties. We needed to approach someone to do it, and Lisa Lisa Cullity, uh, as health inspector, uh, is in town. Uh, she's capable of performing the job, so it made sense to have her do it. So it's it's separate and apart from her duties. It's not a um, it it's not within her scope of work 
or Rick's scope of work in, in his sense in, the, in their normal uh, duties. So it, it's separate and apart. But it makes sense to have these people who have a skill set that lend themselves perfectly uh, to these positions. So it's it's not double dipping. Okay. Okay. Uh, it, it, History back on this too is not necessarily the chief job because I took over for uh, the entire chief Bolter as a sergeant, and Mike Hill took over for the deputy chief Emmanuel as a captain. So we've had this job for the last 10 years in different ranks. So it's not something associated with uh, just being the chief. Here. Well, no, I was just wondering basically just being a town employee also. If it's under different statutes and like I said, all above the board, then I'm good to go. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, that's what they said. Mike, and it, this is past muster with the <coughs> auditors. Yeah. It falls yeah, under a special employee. Okay. Town sees fit, they can have other people, not just the chief. Sure. The not a big fan job. No, it's an, it's an excellent question, and, and, and if uh, someone in the public didn't didn't know some of the background <coughs> that they are separate and apart, uh, you know, could could raise an eyebrow, right. uh, but it, it's it's not the case in reality. But the clarification right now for the public, um, I'm good with that. Thank sure. You. Actually, at one time the the emergency management director was one person, and um, was not the police chief or the fire chief, <coughs> and um, they merged those two positions together. Um, when I took over as, as uh, emergency management director, along with um, Emmanuel on the fire department, because it was it was a position where you're working hand in hand with police and fire and DPW on emergency situations. So it just makes sense to have somebody in that position um, that's already there to be in charge of of something to um, to get people to do things. So if you as a civilian jumped in to try to tell the police or the fire what to do, you'd probably have a hard job where the police chief uh, can do that. And where they did the co-direct the part of it, they put the both of them together, police and fire together. Whereas originally way back it used to be just one person. Uh, but on this list also, I had a, a question on town council that uh, I don't think we need to address this year, but every couple of years we actually put it out to bid and I think if we can put it on our collective memory banks for next year to actually put this out to bid um, town council does a good job um, there, there are times when I do disagree with them uh, but in general they, they do a good job but it does make sense to put it out to bid to uh, keep them honest with nothing else so if we can, I would agree with that 100%. Keep that in mind for next year. Um, All righty, we will keep that in mind. Is uh, there a motion? I was just about to ask that. So, uh, is there a motion on this? There's item? a motion, but no second. <coughs> second. Oh, I made the motion. I second. All righty, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye as well. Any opposed? Hearing none. These all pass unanimously. Next, we'll be moving on to consider recommendation to appoint Laura De Silva <coughs> to the Pembroke Cultural Council. Move to appoint Ms. De Silva. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, I vote as well. Any opposed? Hearing none, she is now appointed. And lastly, under the board action items, will we vote to approve the minutes of June 11th, 2018? Mr. Stone, I would move that we accept the uh, minutes as printed on June 11th, 2018. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I vote aye as well. President, not voting. So that passes with one abstain. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was enjoying myself when you <laughs> Moving on to old business, of which we have a record of approved bills and payrolls from June 18th, 2018. Can you read 
that or do you want to read it? I think it was signed by you, right? <coughs> yeah. I can read it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so for the act of um, Governor Charles Baker, who signed in a law uh, August 9, 2016, for uh, to modernize municipal finance and government under Section 54 and 55, a record um, of the board designee, on which was myself, on June 18, 2018, uh, pleased to report that I personally reviewed two accounts payable uh, warrants totaling. Uh, $123,645.25 and one payroll warrant totaling $251,659.73 prepared by the town accountant and itemized and authorized the itemized expenditures for payment. Move to accept. Second. All right, is there a motion to second? All those in favor? Aye. All right. I vote aye as well. Any opposed? Yeah, none. This passes. I have one thing under old business. If sure. If that's where it is. Uh, we have two open seats in the CPC committee. Uh, one's for the planning board, and the other one is open space, I believe. Uh, if we can put a call out to those two committees to uh, appoint someone in the near future, it would be helpful. All right. That is a great opportunity to get involved in the town. I also have one thing on your old business. Ed, have we made any progress on banning electronic trucks? Yeah, we uh, got some information regarding that, and we're trying to see if there's uh, any communities in Massachusetts that have taken any action on that. Um, Sabrina was kind enough to download a bunch of information, so we've got uh, a lot of Im information regarding those vehicles. So uh, I put out a call to a couple of the South Shore communities and uh, maybe we'll have to do it statewide because right now um, we haven't seen anything from anybody uh, regarding those vehicles. All right, sounds like good progress. Thank you. Moving on to ask the selectmen. No, sorry. Moving on to town administrator's report. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, because we've had a couple of vacancies in the uh, in the office. Um, Sabrina and I have come up with a plan that we think will best suit um, the uh, the office going forward uh, and regarding the personnel that we've been um, uh, looking at um, to, ha to uh, work in that office. So right now we have uh, Sabrina, whose position obviously was upgraded last fall, and, and two uh, principal clerk positions, uh, which those folks were at top step so um, we are I'm going to recommend to the board that we reorganize that office and have a one principal clerk and one administrative assistant uh, and uh, that administrative assistant will be handling a lot of uh, complicated issues including um, spearheading the uh, affordable housing situation um, right now the old colony planning council has drafted a, uh, a housing production plan for the town um, and then we'll need to have that updated and work in conjunction with the planning assistant and the planning board. Uh, Old Colony is coming before the planning board uh, on the 9th of July to talk about uh, inclusionary zoning uh, for new subdivisions. So uh, basically um, what I'm asking the Board of Selectmen um, acting as the wage and personnel board and the board of selectmen to authorize um, myself to uh, create a new position in the selectmen's office of administrative assistant as opposed to principal clerk and the money that we have budgeted for FY19 is uh, more than sufficient to handle the uh, to handle that what are we doing with the uh, passports? Uh, nothing right now. Um, we believe, you know, that we've uh, talked to the library director about it, and uh, there's a possibility that that might uh, that might be uh, transferred to the library. So. Okay. Well, your reorganization sounds like a good idea. 
And if you're looking for a motion from the board, I would move the recommendation of the town administrator. Second. All right, there's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 as well. Any opposed? Hearing none, it's passed unanimously. Thank you. We move on to ask the selectmen. You know, I already asked the audience, there's no questions from them. Does anybody from the board have anything? Uh, the only thing that I'd like to say is that um, um, the uh, Heron Run superintendent um, is working with uh, Landis um, and the Division of Marine Fisheries to, to um, do a bypass. Um, this year has been a, um, a tremendous year for fish that came up, and we'll, we've had fish returning already um, that have been leaving going downstream, which is which is very unusual, and um, right in the middle of this very unusual thing that the fish are already going down, they usually wait till September, and they're going down in June. Um, so um, we found out that they were blocking off the stream at the Hammond Run down there, and um, the superintendent went and talked with, uh, with Landers, and they put in a couple of new pipes, diversion pipes, uh, prior to their work that they're going to be doing down there and uh, I would think by this weekend they're going to have everything uh, pretty well pretty well set um, so that it can go back to the regular um, part of everything being open but, but right now the diversion pipes are, uh, would be carrying any fish out that were in the stream and uh, we actually reduce the amount of water going downstream you know, by um, by putting in some um, some more boards and some boards that had uh, smaller holes in them, so we eliminating the amount of water that's going downstream, but enough to supply um, the streams to keep running. So um, and we also put in a uh, net in one of uh, location to stop any fish this week from any of the juveniles this week from getting down into the construction part of it. So um, they have not seen any juvenile fish down at the uh, site where they're doing all the work, which is great. And um, we'll get that straightened out by, by next week, and the fish will be on their way, I guess. So it's, uh, it's kind of a very unusual thing um, to happen this, this early. But, um, and we're waiting for a final count. The, the original count was uh, 344,000 this year. Um, but they pulled the counter out because fish were going both ways. And um, when we recognized that, um, they pulled that out, but they also have the North South River watershed takes daily counts of the fish certain times of the day, and they use that formula and give that to the Division of Marine Fisheries to come up with a, um, a figure on how many fish they think are still coming up. So we're still waiting for the final. Um, amount to come up so it's um have another really big year this year so, so pretty, it's going pretty good so just let the board know that yeah, there's good news and it's good that's going to be fixed soon thank you for that so moving on to new business does anybody have any new business for tonight john i do uh i, I went into uh our office and asking about uh, a bill was signed in by governor baker on last Friday, I believe, or not Friday before, which is the $3 million that was the building design of fire and police station. And I wonder if uh, our town administrator, Ed, has anything, was be able to contact or find out if we have any money coming in sooner or later. The, uh, all those were in, in uh, bond bills, and so we're waiting to see whether or not that money is getting released. Um, we have not only that, but there's also a question as to whether or not a million dollars is in another bond bill uh, for the uh, furnace pond dredging project. So we're trying to track those things down to see what the progress uh, is with those. Uh, they're, they're not like earmarks where it's automatically you get a contract it's like we did for several items. Um, the uh, 100,000 for the Herring Run Park improvements and uh, the 25,000 for the uh, 
uh, uh, all-terrain ambulance. Is that correct, Chief? So, so anyway, um, so but I'll be happy to um, report as to the status of those those two items. Thank you. All right, thank you for that update. Thank you, John, for that good question. Moving on to upcoming issues. On July 2nd at 7 p.m., there will be a swearing-in ceremony for Lieutenant Wendy LaPierre, Sergeant Ryan Botto, and Sergeant Ryan or Sean Reddy. On July 23rd at 7 p.m., PAC-TV will be here with an annual report. On August 6th, there will be open special town meeting warrant. On August 17th, that meeting warrant will close. On August 20th at 7 p.m., we will get a Hill Bog project update. And lastly, on September 10th, the regular weekly schedule resumes. Ed, is there a need for executive session tonight? Yes, sir. What do you think will be coming back into public session? I believe we may for the first item. All righty. So two and three, Ed. Correct. Two and three. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, moves that we enter executive session on the Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21, for, I, for reason two, to conduct strategy sessions and contract negotiations with non-union personnel, police chief. And for reason number three, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. River Marsh, Water Street, Mass Housing, 916. Thank you. All right, there's a motion and a second. We're going to take a roll call for this. John? Aye. Yes. Everybody, yes? Yes. Yes. So that is unanimous. We're moving into executive session, and we might be coming back.